and welcome to episode 96 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. And this is John Dinning in Los Angeles. John, how is life in Los Angeles? Things are pretty good, man. I got a concert later on tonight. I'm going out to see, finally, coming out of this chrysalis. Coming out of this chrysalis? You are just in Las Vegas like a week ago, so I don't know if you're yeah, just now me, coming out. That makes me want to go back in it. <laughs> that <laughs> that was no that place to be a you. butterfly. It was fun. We had a good time. I was there for my birthday, as you know. So Yes. It was, uh, it was a good time. I'm finally fully recovered, just in time for today's drink. <laughs> that is, in fact, the case. And next year, perhaps I'll be able to uh, join you guys. I hope so. We'll do a six-month birthday celebration for me. We'll well, invite that you. That would be closer to my birthday then. Yeah, sometime in April. Now, well, March for me, but either way. <laughs> what is the drink that you're having today? I had a bottle of champagne that someone sent me, and I already had some of it, but I've got a little bit left over. So this is a post-birthday champagne, and I feel a little bad. I'm actually blanking on the name of it. I don't even know what this is. I think it's Krug. That's a thing, oh, right? Drinking on the low scale, I see. I think so. Well, if I told you who sent it, you'd understand. <laughs> okay. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I'll leave that one out there in the ether. I can think of a few choice guesses there. Yeah, that's, you, they're probably all correct. Uh, what do you got? I'm actually going very low key today. I am drinking a cider from Golden State, which is a, a company over in Sonoma. And uh, obviously, since they're so close to me, it's in all the grocery stores around here. And it's kind of just an odd. I like cider in general, and this is just a different change of pace for once. Well, there you go. That sounds pretty good. Yeah, this is a low-key, it's funny, low-key drinks for a pretty high-key episode, as we'll see. Yeah. So I like the juxtaposition. It is an interesting one. It, uh, you know, listeners wouldn't know this, but we actually had written an entirely different episode in terms of our outline and idea, and then we decided we didn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we were actually going to record it yesterday, and we sat down and we're like, I don't want to do this. Uh, it's the wrong time of year for it, so we'll <laughs> do it in about six months. Uh, it's a little more generalized in terms of studying for the LSAT. And uh, then we started talking about some random logical reasoning stuff and spawned the idea here, which is something that both you and I have, have used over the years. And, mm -hmm. and we'll get a little bit more into that into a minute. But uh, it also, I think, kind of connects to the song choice. Because mm -hmm. for some people, this will be like, I think, an episode where they're like, all right, I really do know what I'm doing here. And for other people, it will be like... Uh, a little bit darker of an outcome. <laughs> it's going to so humble some do we folks. It's that? definitely going to humble some folks. Well, you picked the song, but I certainly didn't disagree with it. Uh, it's an old My Chemical Romance song called Welcome to the Black Parade off their album, The Black Parade. Yes, indeed. A great, great song. One of my favorites by them. And, of course, the outfits that they wore in that uh, album, that kind of zombie military kind of style. I was always an admirer of those. That's how I'd come back if I was a rock star. Is that right? That type of outfit. Sort of a very monotone Sergeant Peppers. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, monotone. Very much so. Yeah. It's uh, a good tune. The whole album really is, is pretty great start to finish. Although I will say the band took a little while to grow on me, as you well know. I do know. I played your fir their first album for you, and you were like, what is this? Turn it off. Turn this garbage off. <laughs> and then a couple years later, you're like, ah, oh, this My Chemical Romance album's great. I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Took you long enough. It took a girl to convince me. No offense to you. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't try that hard. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's jump into the LSAT yeah, world. What's going it. on there? Well, the biggest thing that's happened uh, in the past week and a half or so, right around my birthday, in fact, was the October score release. Scores for that test came out as planned on the 27th of October. And that included all tests, the regular ones, all the makeups, everything, except for, of course, people whose scores got flagged for some sort of test irregularity or people who hadn't completed the writing sample. Beat that drum. A mm, hundred times over. Yeah, there seemed to be a lot of camera issues that people were reporting where security came back and said, your face was out of out of the frame for too long. Heard that with the LSAT writing quite a bit. Yeah. And I'm not even sure there's much that we can say about it other than obviously your proctor has to work with you on getting that straight. But a lot of people had score delays that I don't think they expected. Uh, there was some theories running around about high score increases and so forth. But I think it was... Something that I told a lot of students was like, you can't fight them on this. If they think there's a security issue, that is their highest, highest priority. They will review that. And if the test security office says, sorry, you're out of luck. There's no mm -hmm. appeal to that. 
they uh, they draw the line. They don't mess around there. So unfortunately, if you were one of those people who had their score canceled, we're sorry to hear that. Yeah, the scrutiny in October, as we talked about, seemed to be higher than normal anyway. And I wonder if this maybe played a little bit into that. I will say, though, on the student end, for those who did get scores, the reaction, I think, was generally pretty positive. I don't know if it was quite as jubilant as we've seen on some tests in the past, but um, it wasn't all doom and gloom. It wasn't the Black Parade that the song might suggest. No, the score release wasn't bad. The scores I, themselves, I, think, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think you actually have, have tagged that pretty well was, was the idea where it was pretty good. I wouldn't say it was jubilant, though. Mm -hmm. I've had test releases where it's like, oh my gosh, this is unprecedented. This wasn't unprecedented to me. It felt a little bit more normal, but there were still those stories where you're like, hmm, that's a big increase. Yeah, some of those early mid-flex tests, it seemed more or less everyone had a positive result to, to brag about. This wasn't quite that, but again, that's what we expected. We knew things would normalize with the addition of the fourth section, et cetera. Things we've talked about before. We do have some updated applicant numbers, though, both in terms of applicants and their scores. You want to run through some of those? Um, I guess I can do that, unless you wanted to. Oh, we can. Let's tag team it. <laughs> so we know the scores came out on October 27th, so that's within the last week. And one of the things that we've been tracking was what does this score bubble look like? And I'll read some numbers off here at the top lines, say from 165 through 180 in, in bands of five, and just give people a sense of what's happening compared to last year. That's a really important marker that I'll circle back to. So in the 175 to 180 range, the number of scores at this point in time compared to last year at this point in time is actually down 22.7%. So it is a fewer number of test scores relative to what we had last year. That's true in the 170 to 174 range too. It's down 7.1%. And 165 to 169 is also down by 2.7%. So when you look at the scores that are 165 to 180, there are fewer of them so far this year at the same time as last year. So the rate is not as fast. Now, that sounds like incredible news. If you're an applicant, oh, fewer high scores means that my good score is actually gonna get me into better schools. But there's a downside to this, and it's easy to miss. And somebody was arguing with me online in a very mild way. I usually, I don't get too aggressive online. And they're like, look, it's gone down. It's a much better situation. And I was like, sure. So far, it looks like it's a little bit better than last year. The problem is you have to realize last year was so wildly inflated compared to the year before that you're still well above the year before. And so that's a little bit of a, a concern. This is still going to be a tough year. This Having the fewer high scores makes it better, but it doesn't just alleviate the problem. You'd have to have the numbers drop far more significantly than this to get back to where we were. Yeah, numbers above 175 last year were double the year before, and now they've dropped down by about a quarter. So it's better, but again, historically speaking, we're still in a bubble. And I want people to understand that this is good news, but it's, you know, this isn't pure relief that some people seem to want to make it. No, and that's exactly the case. This is, for better or worse, precisely what we were talking about over the summer when we said, how do we perceive this year? Not as bad as last year, worse than the year before. Right now, we're completely on track for that. There are slightly more applicants at the moment. And those applicants are applying to more law schools from the looks of it. It's still rather early, though, to say that that's a final trend. Those, the numbers are close enough that they could actually equalize yeah. in the next couple of months here. But I think we're going to end up with a greater number of high scores than we had two years ago. And that means that we're still dealing with a more competitive situation overall. Yeah, there's still a bubble. It has shrunk a little bit. Um, so if you're looking to take away some silver linings, I'd say that is one. Yeah. I, I, who, who doesn't want an improvement? <laughs> you know, everybody wants that improvement. So whether it's a little bit or a lot, we'll take it. Yeah, I'd prefer a lot. And we'll see what happens going forward with the next test. But right now, it is better than last year. It's still going to be competitive, though. Yeah. And it's going to be a slow cycle while these schools try to figure out, is there more of a bubble coming? Is it actually coming down? Will it normalize? They're going to take their time with this. So if you're in that mentality of, I must get my application in instantaneously, maybe this year more than any other year, that is less important right. than it ever has been. 
Yeah. Looking to the future as well. The next thing on the agenda is there's a November test. The last one of the year, it starts this next Friday. So probably a week or so from when this episode comes out. That'll be, <laughs> Dave, I can't see, but I can almost feel you um, sort of shrinking into Rubbing your chair. My face. Yeah. It's uh, that's a rough one, man. That eats your whole weekend and a Friday as well. But, you know, the cross that we bear. So next Friday, that test will kick off. It'll run Friday, Saturday, Sunday with a score release planned for December 1st. So there you go. Registration for your day and time slots for that test is open now. If you haven't signed up for your time, do it. This one actually saw, at least from what I could tell, spots filling up a little faster than normal. So guys, yeah. don't delay when these things open up. Go get registered if you haven't yet. And that score release of December 1st ties perfectly into the January registration window, which will close on the 3rd. So mm -hmm. you'll have roughly two days to kind of contemplate the score that you have from November before deciding whether you want to take January. And again, I, the question that we get all the time is November too late. November is not too late. This is kind of like asked and answered. And you could talk to a number of different experts, or at least people I consider to be experts uh, who do this, and they will agree. I don't even think January is too late, typically and definitely not this year, simply because these schools are going to take their time. Last year was such a wild race that I think they, um, they're going to be very wary about it. And so far, that seems to be what I'm seeing in terms of like results from applications. There's a to me at least, not the big rush that you often see in terms of admissions and acceptances early on. Yeah, I agree with that. In fact, I just had a conversation with a group of people earlier today at an event that I was participating in, and they asked specifically about the November-January discrepancy. And I said January to me is the mid-cycle point, basically. Pre-January or early, January is the middle. Post-January, things start to get later and later, but you're still actually okay, I think, in February and March. If it gives you a better number, better credentials. And it's funny because while we're on that topic, one of the questions I keep getting is, you know, I have this score, say a 165, but I know I can do better. I was, you know, PTing in the 170s. Um, what should I do? Should I apply now and or should I take January and apply later? And I, I always say the same thing. If, if you are signed up for the January test, law schools can see that. Mm -hmm. Most law schools will automatically hold your application because they don't want to make a decision prematurely. They want to see what your score was. You can ask them to hold as well, just if you really want to lock it in. You can also ask them to make a decision on your app, but they don't necessarily follow your request. So if you're thinking, should I apply right this minute, or should I wait until I get my January score? To be honest with you, most of the time, the school pushes you to wait for that January score anyway. That's the way the internal processing works there. And it actually makes sense if you think about why they would do that. Sure. Still worth it, though. If you're on the fence for January, uh, I mean, again, if you have a November score coming, you'll have almost three days with that score before you have to decide. But I'm telling you, it's going to take a lot for someone to convince me January is a bad idea. Agreed. Perfect. One last thing, and then we can actually get into the meat of the evening which is always keep an eye out for the webinars that we have coming up. We do a lot of these free public webinars for people. Most of them are recorded and released to the public. Some aren't like the crystal balls. We don't have another crystal ball on the docket at the moment. We'll see what happens in November to decide whether we do another one. But as of now, we don't have a crystal ball, but we do have tons of other great stuff. So go check out our webinars page. We'll link it here. Get signed up for everything. It never hurts. Yeah, and we've actually slammed out some, I think, some pretty high-quality admissions webinars recently, too. There's a great one this Sunday, in fact. Yeah. The, uh, with the Secrets of the Law School Admissions Process. I believe that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That's a high-interest uh, high one to me. That was a webinar that I wrote and did last year. Uh, that's going to be Jay Donnell who does that. And he and I did the, the Law School Personal Statement webinar mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, and the feedback we got on that is always awesome. I think people walk in thinking, will I really learn anything? And then they walk out like, oh, there's actually a lot to learn. I'm like, <laughs> yes, there is. There's a ton of secrets in the law school process too. So if you're in the midst of applying or you're about to apply, uh, log into that. That is free. And uh, I think you'll get a lot of value out of it. For sure. Plus Jay's just a stud. He's a great guy to listen to. So yes, go for the is. entertainment and come away knowledgeable. Yeah. He's a super entertaining guy. <laughs> Not just online either. In person, he's super fun too. Introduced us to slap shots, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best games. I hope those videos never get out. I uh, know. I deleted all mine. No, well, I didn't. God. 
<laughs> the blackmail looms. Oh, um, there's <laughs> yourself in a New York City bar. Yeah, that's right. By four guys who were drinking too much. All right. Let's move on to more sober matters. Yes. LR tests. Um, how do you want to describe this as we lean into it? Because we've never done anything quite like this in an episode before. No, we really haven't. And I think it's a really cool idea. And I think we may take it to some of the other sections too, but we'll have to see about that. Let's first talk about the genesis of where this idea came from. Mm -hmm. You and I were talking yesterday after we decided to shelve the episode we were looking at until later. We're talking about some posts that I'd seen recently where people were saying, oh yeah, I read like the LR Bible in three days and I got tons out of it. And you know, you can do it really quick. And I, I think I was saying to you, that mentality I think is both good and bad because I love the fact that someone's like, hey, I, I tried to squeeze as much as I could out in a short time and I'm all about efficiency and the test is approaching. Sure. At the same time, knowing that that book took me, well, I mean, about 10 months of actual time and you know, probably like 15 years of professional preparation, I know how many details are in that book and I know for a fact that if you try to read it in three, four or five days, you're going to miss a lot of the nuance. There's mm -hmm. just subtle points in there over and over where I'm like, I'm not trying to beat people over the head, but I'm like, this is a really important idea, but I can't exactly put it in neon red. Otherwise, you know, 50% of the book would be in red. Right. So it was something where we were talking about that particular idea and, you know, whether or not people know what they've actually kind of studied. And this goes for our courses too. And I started talking to you about the idea that when students come to me and they're like, well, I really know this concept or I've read the book and I know it, or I've gone through that lesson and I really know it. A lot of times I have like set questions that I will ask them. And your response was, I do the same thing. Yep. Kind of a litmus test where we're like, well, let's see how well you really know it. Um, and I used to do this uh, in, in the very long past days when I used to answer the phone and talk to students about the LSAT just on our straight power score lines. I'd always get calls from people who were looking at other companies and they'd maybe taken a course from someone else. And they'd be like, well, I already took this. And I'd be like, well, let me ask you a few questions, see what you really know. And then we'd have this conversation, this back and forth. And this litmus test is this idea of a series of quick self-checking questions that we are using to see, well, how well do you really know what it is that we think you should know about LSAT logical reasoning? And so we came up with a series of 20 questions, some of them with multi-parts to them, right. that we're going to ask tonight. Yeah, where I would often employ some of these, not all 20, I mean, this is, we've clearly outdone ourselves here, but <laughs> where I would often do this is if I'd get somebody coming to me clearly frustrated about like, I know this stuff, I've read the book, I've memorized the reasoning Bible, why am I not scoring better? I know what I'm doing. And then it becomes like, a, all right, a proving ground. Let's see how well you really do know it. And it's not just that they would be able to answer these questions, it's that that be immediate, instinctual. These would be such a natural thing to think about and have internalized that the question itself almost comes with its own answer. It's that organic and natural. And of course, when people can't do that, or think their way through it, it demonstrates gaps in knowledge. So this isn't meant to humble anyone, although that often is the case. This is really meant to demonstrate whether you know quite as much as you think you do, and as well as you think you know it. Yeah, the entire point here is that we think these are standard things that every you know, reasonably well-prepared LSAT student should know without hesitation and without <laughs> delay. And so as we read through these questions, what we'll do is we'll first read through the 20 questions and the, the variants that are therein. We'll, we'll wait a, you know, a couple seconds after each one, and then we'll go back to the very beginning and then talk about the answers to each. So you'll hear the 20 questions. You'll have your clear opportunity to say, do I know the answer to this instantaneously? And then we'll come back and revisit it. But what we're looking for is an answer where you instantaneously know the answer with detail. Mm -hmm. So if you give a vague answer or you're a little bit uncertain or you stumble over something, nope, that's not good enough. This is a speed test. You are timed on the LSAT, as we all know. And so speed matters. If you are taking time to think, well, how do I do this? Or what does that mean? That's lost time on the test. You can know this stuff beforehand, so you don't want to be stumbling on it or be slow with it or be vague. You want absolute certainty. And of course, we've kept to questions that lend themselves to a little bit more certitude 
as opposed to this kind of like more vague, sprawling stuff that we could ask about. Yeah. That's not what our focus is. So this isn't going to cover every topic in logical reasoning. It's going to leave out a ton of different ones, but it's a pretty good sampling of concepts across the spectrum. And it often reveals that in some areas, people are missing information that I'll be honest, I think you should have. And I know, John, you agree with that. Yeah, and that they're likely unaware that they're missing. I think this is probably going to peel some curtains back that you didn't even know were there. Um, I'll make one other disclaimer, and then I think we can launch into it. I got asked this morning, Dave, by a guy. He's like, come on, man, when's your next podcast? And I said, we're actually recording it this afternoon. You know, patience, Padawan. <laughs> and he goes, what's it about? And I said, well, you'll see, but I'll give you this tip. You're probably going to want to pause it a lot as we go. And I would give that tip to any listener right now, too. Take as much time as you need to think these questions over, because once we ask them, we're going to move on. We'll circle back and explain, but we're not going to repeat ourselves as we go through the list. So pause as you need to. No. And then we'll talk a little bit about the answers that we're going to give when we kind of return to that. Right. So, so here's our 20 question list, the, the ultimate LSAT logical reasoning litmus test to ultimate. see whether you really know LSAT logical reasoning concepts and ideas and what to do in certain situations. Some of these should be real simple. Some of them might have answers that are a little more tricky. So yeah. just ask yourself if you know the difference instantly. And again, I'll just read each one of them. No comment on it. Give it a second or two and move on to the next one. So let's start with number one. What is the difference between a fact set and an argument? Number two, in the terms of the LSAT, what is the definition of an assumption? And also, what's an explicit assumption? Number three, what does the correct answer in a strengthen accept question do in logical terms? Number four, of the LSAT logical reasoning question families, which pairs are most similar and why? Number five, explain the difference between a mistaken negation and a mistaken reversal. Ooh, my turn. Number six, what are the two techniques for diagramming unless and related words, statements? Number seven, what does, quote, when but only when do in conditional relationships? Number eight, what's the difference between causality and conditionality? Number nine, how do you weaken a causal argument? How do you weaken a conditional argument? And number 10, Let's talk about common assumption scenarios, two of them. What is the central assumption in causality? And what is the central assumption in historical comparisons? Number 11. What's the difference between must be true questions and necessary assumption questions? Number 12. What's the difference between a justify the conclusion or sufficient assumption question, or really the idea, as well as a necessary assumption? Number 13, what kind of question type is this? Which one of the following, if assumed, does the most to justify the conclusion? Number 14, we'll venture into some formal logic terminology. Define the word some. Now define the word most. And finally, define the term either or. And then number 15, asking about flaws in the reasoning. What flaw is represented by the phrase presupposes what it sets out to prove? And then what flaw is represented by the <laughs> description presumes without justification that a circumstance sufficient to guarantee a particular outcome is in fact required for that outcome. Yuck. Number 16. What's the meaning and the difference between the common flaw answers, quote, takes for granted, dot, 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 and overlooks the possibility, dot, dot, dot. 17. 
What does not need to be matched or paralleled in parallel reasoning questions? 18. What logical reasoning question family does evaluate the argument fit into? Question 19. List all the question types that have a definitive or concrete method by which you can prove the correct answer. And finally, question 20. Can you ever prove that a sufficient condition occurs as part of a conclusion? And that's it. So, <laughs> yeah. That felt like Jeopardy where the... No, no, no. I know. <laughs> the clock's going. Ah, yeah. uh, Yes. Which, you know, on a, on a various level, all those terms, if you're, especially if you're a power score student, should make a lot of sense to you. Sure. But it's tough to be put on the point of a knife to say, all right, define this. And you can say vaguely, well, I, I kind of know what it is. I'm like, that's not what I'm asking for. I'm asking for your pure understanding of the concept, both in an abstract sense and in a detailed, concrete sense. So... We're going to talk about each one of those questions now, and I'm going to make a point beforehand. What we're going to do is give the answers, maybe make a few extra comments. We're not here to explain each concept here. Uh, that's beyond the scope of what we can do in an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, and that's also what we do in our books and our courses and tutoring and so forth. So trying to explain some of these ideas, like, for example, question families, which came up more than once, uh, we'll talk a little bit about it, but we're not going to go deep into it because I could spend 45 minutes talking about that pretty easily. Yeah. The difference in a necessary and a sufficient assumption. Have a seat. Get comfortable. The point here really is to determine whether you need further explanations of these ideas of these questions. Because if you do, then go seek them out. These are clear gaps in your knowledge, which means you're vulnerable to the test. Yeah, and if you're sitting there and you're scoring 166... And you're like, I wish I could, you know, improve. This is something that can tell you where is, is it LR that I need to do more work on? Because people who are at the upper echelon in logical reasoning either intuitively know the answers to this or they, you know, very much explicitly know the answer to it and can automatically address it. So, and usually it's the latter because they've studied through all these ideas and they're pretty comfortable with what's going on at this point. Yeah. So, John? I, I think I'd get at least 17. <laughs> right. That's my own. <laughs> the, the funny thing was, is I think you and I were having a laugh because we wrote all this down and we're like, well, we didn't write the answers down. We haven't even, we're yeah. both like, good. All we have here are the questions. <laughs> there are no answers. Nobody had to stop and say like, I better write my answer down. <laughs> this looks very incomplete if someone were to glance over our shoulders here. Yeah, it's just a series of questions that we <laughs> have here. But I mean, this is what we do. So we should know the answers. But if you think about it from a student perspective, this is what you're learning to do. And this is what we're telling you are the types of things that you sh can and should know instantly. Mm -hmm. So let's start with number one. What's the difference between a fact set and an argument? One of my favorite basic questions, and I think this is one that if you don't get it right, I'm disappointed. So, I mean, the real operating aspect is, is that an argument contains a conclusion, whereas a fact set is just a series of statements. One could make the argument that it's just a premise set. Um, that means in an argument, when you have a conclusion, you have an opinion. You're being told something uh, thereafter. And so the author takes some type of stance, draws some type of position from those premises. So it's almost like they're the same base, but the argument adds a conclusion, goes that extra step further, and that often opens up the idea of flaws, exactly. strengthen, weaken, etc. Yeah, facts. Whereas you sets, don't see that. Oh, sorry, I was going to say facts sets tend to lead to you having to draw conclusions like a syllogism or something. Arguments tend to invite potentially faulty conclusions on the part of the author. Yeah, and the question types that you get from the two are totally different. Fact sets, because they don't have a conclusion, end up being a lot of must be true, cannot be true, maybe resolve the Resolved. paradox, whereas arguments have a completely different set of type of questions. That's where strength and weak and flaw, et cetera, comes into play. Mm -hmm. So we consider that an easy question. You know, that's a one-star question in terms of difficulty. Someone just turned the episode off. Uh, <laughs> <I> <laughs> well... Quit. Uh, that tells you what the level is that we expect. I expect high level, man. If I'm going to work with students and help them out and they're telling me I can't get better or I already know this, I'm like, let's check it and see. That's a, something that every LSAT student should know the answer to without 
any exemption. Yeah, I would say the same for question two. What's an assumption in LSAT terms? And then a follow-up, what's an explicit assumption? What do these terms mean? Um, I'm going to start with explicit assumption because that's just a premise. That's just something that's actually given in the stimulus as part of the argument, something the author believes is a building block towards an opinion. An assumption itself is something unmentioned, but required for the argument to even begin to make sense or be possible. It's a belief that the author holds that's so fundamental, so foundational, he or she didn't even, as of the way I tend to see it, didn't even feel the need to say it out loud. Like, obviously this, let's just get into the real stuff. Yeah, and I love the assumption idea because you say it's so foundational. It's a premise of the argument. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it's an unstated premise. So it's something they didn't say. And then when you add explicit in front of assumption, it's kind of contradictory in a way. It's like, well, it's explicitly an unstated premise. Well, the explicit overrides the unstated, and now they're saying it's really just a premise. Yeah, assumptions are implied by definition until they say explicit, and then they have to be there. Yeah, something they actually said. But unstated premise means that it's part of the argument. That's one of the foundational pieces for understanding some of the techniques that can be used to solve these questions. It's why the assumption negation technique works, because the author is relying 100% on the truth and viability of that assumption in order to hold the rest of the argument together. Yeah. A lot of people, I think, see assumptions as peripheral or tangential, but no, assumptions are the backbone of arguments. Okay. Let's, let's look at number, number three. three. Oh, <laughs> you want me to do it? All right. Yeah. This is a pretty straightforward one, actually. Um, what does the correct answer in a strengthen except question do? This is a two-part answer because there's two things that it can do. The short answer is anything but strengthen. But that opens up the categories of both weaken and irrelevance, neutrality. And that neutrality is where most of the right answers in strengthen except questions live. But it also, I think... Um, avoids a degree of detection from people because they think the opposite of strength and must be to hurt. And that is not the case. Yeah, and neutrality here is just another way of saying has no effect, sure. doesn't matter, is really irrelevant to the argument or isn't having any type of effect on it. But I always tell people, I'm like, look, it's not like I'm going to get crazy about you know classifying questions, but they're using things like accept to slow you down. So please go in knowing how to handle that and to understand the outcomes. Because if you don't know precisely what you're looking for in the answers, you're hurting yourself. Sure. You're going to be slower and less certain, and that is going to cause you lost time. That's what we're trying to avoid here. Absolutely. I want you to take question four, if you don't mind. Of the LSAT logical reasoning question type families, which pairs are most similar and why? Now, in our books and courses, we talk about the four question families. And what they do is they oversee the flow of information and explain what you take as true, what effects you're trying to have. Uh, family one is the prove family. So a lot of must be true type of stuff, but also method and flaw and parallel fall into that as well. Family two is strengthen or helping. So strengthen, justify, assumption, uh, resolves part of that as well. Family three is weakening the argument. And family four is essentially hurting the answer. It's typically cannot be true is the question that falls in there. And so this is a question that is very abstract. And you might say a little bit unfair of me to ask it, which of course is why I asked it, because not every one of these is going to be fair. <laughs> Life's not fair. Deal with it. Yeah. Well, the first pair that is going to jump out at you is going to be one and four as a pair and two and three. One and four as a pair take information in the stimulus and tell you to accept it as true. So both of them are the same. The difference is that must be true then uses that to prove the answer and cannot be true. Family four uses it to disprove an answer. But they're similar in the sense that you accept the information as true and then use that to kind of like determine your correct answer. So that's one pair that's really similar. The other pair inside that is two and three. And they're actually reversed. In those questions, whether it's strengthen or weaken or what have you, the authors tell you to accept the answer choices as true. Notice that's different. We're not accepting the stimulus as true like we did in one and four. We're accepting the answer choices as true. And on the basis of that, use that information to see how it affects the argument. So one and four have a natural affinity, and then two and three have a natural affinity. But there's other affinities as well. Three and four both have negativity in them. 
three is weaken, four is cannot. And so even though the arrows are going in different ways, there's a negative component to it. Whereas one and two don't have that negativity, they're more positive. One is prove it based upon the stimulus and two is to help out based upon the answer choices. And those are actually more positive things that you're typically doing for the argument. Yeah, affirming is the way that I tend to think about it. In family one, the stimulus affirms an answer choice. In family two, with strength, then the answer choice affirms the argument. Notice I didn't necessarily say guarantees or proves, but there's a logical connection of description and relevance. Yeah, and I think most people who are familiar with the way the question families work understand that what it is is it's identifying the flow of information and giving you a complete roadmap for when to operate with certainty mm -hmm. and to look for the effect that you're trying to achieve within the question. To me, that is like the, the golden compass that you have inside the LSAT that says, follow me and you will get to where you need to be. Yeah, that if was a don't breakthrough understand moment. Sorry, go, go. No, no, um, if you don't understand that and you're like, I don't get this, go learn it because it is something that to me is foundational to the way the test operates. And if somebody is uncertain about those concepts, they tend to actually be weaker in doing the harder level questions because they're not quite sure of what they're doing. Yeah. I was going to say, sorry to interrupt you. That was a breakthrough moment for me. It was just recognizing that in every question, there was a component you could absolutely trust, firm, solid ground, and you could stand there and then scrutinize the rest of the landscape. Going down, live in the stimulus. Going up, the answer choices. But that was a revelation to me way back when. Yeah. And it's a powerful thing. I love to talk about it. It is very abstract. So a lot of people just skim over it. So they question families. But if you think about it, what appear to be four basic informational relationships, that really narrows down the field quite a bit when you're thinking about all the different types of questions they ask. And all of a sudden, you start thinking, well, what's the difference between a must be true and a method of reasoning question? it's not nearly as significant as it would seem on the surface. They're the ba same basic idea underneath. One of them is concrete, one of them is more abstract. Once you understand that, you start treating them the same way, you start using the same type of ideas to solve them, the whole test narrows and gets easier to navigate. 100%. John? Question five. Yeah. I like this one. I play with this one with people in class sometimes in lesson two. Explain the difference in conditional reasoning between a mistaken negation and a mistaken reversal, the two common traps that you see with conditional relationships. And again, the sort of pithy answer here would be, there is no difference. They are simply contrapositives of one another. A mistaken negation and a mistaken reversal are committing the same error. They're just doing it in ways that superficially appear to be slightly different. They both yeah. treat the sufficient and the necessary as the opposite one. Yeah, the way I always like to describe this in class is you got confused. You, you mixed up what was sufficient and necessary, and because of that, you made a mistake. How it's expressed and the way it visually appears is either the mistaken negation or alternately the mistaken reversal. But as you said, when you look at a, an original statement and then say like A arrow B, and then you take the mistaken negation of it, and then you take the mistaken reversal of it, those two mistakes will be contrapositives of each other. So it's really the same thing, because the statement and it's contrapositive are identical in meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, uh, the lure is essentially the absence of a sufficient or the presence of a necessary. Neither of those do a single thing in conditionality. Both of them are appealing because essentially they commit the same mistake. Yeah, I, I often have described it, it's like you're looking at a coin and mm -hmm. each side of the coin looks different, but intrinsically, both sides represent the same value proposition. It's a penny or five cents or whatever it might be. That's exactly what a mistake in negation and a mistake in reversal are. They're different looks at the same intrinsic error that's yeah. actually occurring here. It's just in this case, the coin's counterfeit. <laughs> I like that. Thanks. <laughs> that's good. It is indeed a counterfeit coin. <laughs> All right, let's move to number six. And that is, what are the two techniques for diagramming unless... Statements that involve unless, A, unless, B, that kind of thing. The one that we advocate is known as the unless equation. And what it does is it takes the phrase or idea or variable that is modified by unless, and it makes it the necessary condition. Then you negate the remainder and put it on the sufficient side. We like doing this because unless is often used in conjunction with statements that have negatives in them, and this removes the negatives. 
it tends to produce a statement that is positive on both sides. And there's no slashes on either the sufficient or the necessary. So that is the method that we advocate because more often than not, it gives you the cleanest look at what happens. The alternative method is to say that unless is equal to if not. And so now, because you have if, that's going to become the sufficient condition, but you're putting a negation on it. The downside to this is although at kind of like first glance, you're like, well, that's easier, it usually produces statements that have both sides negated. And then a lot of people end up taking the contrapositive anyway, which means they're back to the first method. But those are the two ways you could handle this. And for me, the first one is by far superior because it usually takes a step out of the process. It's really quick once you learn how to do it. But if not, works as well. Yeah. I was a hard sell on this, but you did sell me eventually. Um, this is currency that is not counterfeit. The, the unless equation that we advocate does, I think, actually produce better results on the whole. I can guarantee that it does, having looked at every unless statement that ever appeared on the LSAT and at one point counting the numbers to see what the percentage was. And it was like 79%. Oh my God. Might have been 80, might have been the low 80s. It was up there where I was like, look, why are, why are we wasting time with talking about if not when it's going to actually slow people down? Because yeah. most people mentally do not work with negative statements and negative variables as well as they work with positive statements and positive variables. Yeah. I'm less blown away by how lopsided that is and by more by the fact that you did it. You lunatic. But You have to be. Uh, That's, you know, this is what we do, man. Proofs on data, right? <laughs> That's true. Proofs on data. Well done. All right. Speaking of conditionality, here's a good one. What does the phrase, quote, when but only when do in conditional relationships, what would that phrase, if you encountered it, create? And the answer is that it creates a double arrow, a biconditional, as it's sometimes called. And you see other forms of this as well. The more classic form, and this is why we didn't use it, is if and only if, or if but only if. You see this in games sometimes, occasionally it pops up in logical reasoning. That contains both a sufficient condition indicator, the if or the when, and a necessary condition indicator, the only if or the only when. Because they put them both in there, you have the arrow moving in both directions. Know that. If you see it, it's a free point, as far as I'm concerned. It is, because they always ask you about the biconditionality of it. And if you're interested, if you say something like, um, A, if and only if B, or A, when and only when B, what you're saying is there's only two possible outcomes in that world with A and B. One of them is that they both occur, and the other is that neither occur. There's no other variation on that. As soon as you know one, you know the other in terms of its status. So that's just one of the, it's it's a free point, and in fact, something they used to throw out a little bit earlier on the LSAT. I don't. I think they've gotten away from it because they realized that we could teach this so well that students could crush it. But it's exactly the kind of thing that they like to throw out once in a blue moon. And then if you know it, you're just laughing all the way to the LSAT bank. Yeah, it's also a perfect, and this is why we're here, test of the depth of your knowledge of conditionality. If you knew that right away, well done. Speaking of conditionality, <laughs> let's go to number eight, which is what's the difference between causality and conditionality? It's a little bit more abstract here. And it doesn't really matter where you start with this you have to get to the heart of a couple of different issues. Uh, one of the issues is going to be what actual kind of occurrence is happening, what's making something happening, what's the, the motivation of it, and the other is going to be temporality or time. Mm -hmm. So in a causal argument, the cause actually makes the effect happen. It's an actual engine of occurrence. So when a cause is happening, you know that it's materially making the effect occur. That's not true in conditional reasoning. The sufficient condition doesn't make the necessary condition happen from a physical sense. All it is is a sign that it has happened. When you know the sufficient has happened, that tells you that the necessary either already happened, is happening now, or at least will happen at some point in the future. And that then goes to the temporality aspect of this relationship, which is that in a cause and effect relationship, cause always happens first. The effect might be a microsecond later, but the cause is happening first because it has to start the process to go. In a conditional relationship, either one can happen first. Mm -hmm. That really drives people crazy because they're like, well, the sufficient happens first. I'm like, mm-mm. It yeah. doesn't have to. Any order chronologically. 
Yeah, I tend to think yeah that foresight. Yeah, I tend to think of like causality with activator and conditionality with indicator. The sufficient just tells you something. It's like a slide you can move down, but nothing actually occurred there that was forceful. Causality, there's action, there's force and productivity to it. That to me is the key distinction, but I like the chronology thing too. Yeah, I think you, uh, you know, that's exactly how we describe it in the course, like the activator, the indicator. Mm -hmm. But that's an interesting thing because if you're hearing this and you're saying to yourself, wait, conditional, you know, they, they, the time factor doesn't matter. That can really mess with your head a little bit if you haven't thought about it. But go look at the many different statements that are out there and you'll quickly realize sometimes the necessary happens first, sometimes the sufficient happens first. It also means that if you're trying to analyze conditional statements by saying which one happens first, you are going to get destroyed by this test. They set you up to go down hard if that's the way you try to look at it. Absolutely. Speaking of causality, as we continue this thread, um, question nine was how do you weaken a causal argument? And then 9b, about what about a conditional argument? We'll get to that. Let's start with causality. How do you weaken causality? This is my favorite question, John. Well, then I would be ashamed if I took it. You go ahead. Because I always say, this is the one I always would ask first. I was like, how do you weaken a causal argument? And people would say, um, well, you look for something that undermines it. I'm like, no, 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 I want specifics. <laughs> get into it. And then eventually we'd hear, well, there's an alternate cause. And what I would always say is, no, no, I want it faster and immediate. I want you to say that there are five ways to do it. There's an alternate cause. You present scenarios where the cause occurs and the effect doesn't, or you present scenarios where the effect occurs and the cause doesn't. You look for a reverse cause scenario, or you look for problems with the data. Those are the five ways to do it. Zero delay. That's what I want to hear. So if you stop to yourself and you're like, wait, how do you weaken it? It's an alternate cause, I think. I can't remember the others. Not good enough. Now, now we're getting harsh, or at least I am. <laughs> I don't mean to be harsh. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, you, uh, do. you have got to kind of like learn that because you, you don't want to delay on that. When I'm scanning through a causal problem and I know that they've drawn a conclusion that was based upon a relationship and said, well, this is what made it happen, I'm immediately thinking, throw me one of these five. And they don't always fit the exact bill there. There are kind of like advanced versions of this and, and partial causes and so forth that float around. But from a basic causality standpoint, oftentimes I can see the answers falling into these kind of like frameworks and quickly identify it. So you have to know it as well. Yeah, that alt cause thing in particular seems to really be at the heart of the matter. What about, yeah. oh, sorry, what about 9B? How do you weaken a conditional argument? Well, what's a conditional you know, conclusion is saying that if you have the sufficient, you must have the necessary. Well, the way to destroy that is to say that you don't absolutely have to have the necessary condition. A conditional relationship is built upon the idea that when the sufficient condition occurs, the necessary condition must occur. So if you get a conclusion that's saying this is what's going on, and it's a conditional relationship in the conclusion there, all you have to do is find a scenario where the sufficient can happen and the necessary did not. That's it. You just need that mm -hmm. one counterexample that is out there. It's actually fairly easy. There were early questions on the LSAT that were really tough with this. And then again, I think they figured out, hey, this is something that is learnable. And boy, these people can really, you know, pin it down. Yeah, the formulaic but, nature of that, we've talked about this in crystal balls, is something they seem to be straying a little further afield from lately because it is so mechanistic. It's almost like the double arrow thing in question seven. Um, if they just began to test that so routinely or so directly, uh, it'd be free points. You still need to know it because it's a free point if it does come up, but you can't quite Actually, hang your hat on its appearance like you used to. Yeah, you see this more on LSAT India than you do on the current domestic uh, LSAT that most all of us are familiar with. This is true. All right, John, how about number 10 for you? Yeah, this gets us back into causality a little bit too. Question 10 was this. Let's talk about some common assumption scenarios. So situations that you would see in the stimulus of an assumption question, a necessary assumption question. And I'm gonna present two of these. And the question was, what is the central assumption? What's at the heart of the assumption in both of these scenarios? And the first was an argument about causality. If the author makes a causal claim in an assumption stimulus, what do you expect the answer choice essentially to be about or to deal with? And the answer to that question is, 
alternate causes. That's my first expectation. I expect an answer to deny an alternate cause or to say that something else couldn't have led to that effect. That is something the author depends on in order to say that his or her can, uh, cause led to the effect. But any of the five that Dave just mentioned are actually fair game here. An assumption is that cause and effect go together. An assumption is that when one is missing, the other isn't. So all the ways that Dave just discussed about weakening causality, if you see causality in an assumption question, expect those to happen in the answer choice. But at the top of my list, and if I've got money on one, it's alternate causes. Yeah, if you're trying to undermine it. If you, if you go back to the central assumption of what's happening is that if an author says this occurred, then this occurred, therefore I conclude that this caused this. Right. The kind of like incredibly powerful idea behind the basic assumption, which is make the rest of this work, is that in fact, it's that one thing that makes it happen and nothing else. Yeah, the assumption is that there's not an alternate cause. The assumption is that yeah. they can't exist singularly. Precisely. So that's what I expect. But again, and alternate causes, the denial of alternate causes is what I expect there. Yeah. That's why that's how you weaken these types of arguments is you start introducing scenarios where it didn't always happen that way. And so that's a really powerful thing to understand. Once you understand that central assumption, it really kind of allows you to see all the different ways they try to manipulate it and, and strengthen, weaken questions and so forth. Yeah. And it also reveals the language that they use in things like method of reasoning or flaw in the reasoning. It plays perfectly into the assumption negation technique. Because if the answer denies an alternate cause and you negate it, you've just brought in an alternate cause. The argument cannot tolerate that. The other scenario I gave you for an assumption stimulus was historical comparisons. And I should probably elaborate on what this means. It's when you use things that happened in the past, however long ago, the circumstances and the details there, to try to draw conclusions or make predictions about things that are happening now. You compare the present to the past. What is the central assumption in making that comparison or in trying to believe that it's valid? The essential assumption to that is constancy. Nothing has changed. So what they do is they deny changes. You see these a lot in defender assumptions. Such and such temperature tolerance haven't changed. The beetles haven't evolved. The island's weather hasn't gotten warmer. I think I all of those exactly are actually the same you're talking about. As soon as you said temperature tolerances and beetles, I was like, hmm, I, wonder I know what that question you're referring to. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great example of it. It's but perfect. there are countless others. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, is that when they look back on history, oftentimes what you see the author doing is imagining that history is really constant in most things. If something did change, that's fine. But everything else, say the weather, you know, a thousand years ago and today, it's roughly the same humidity levels, uh, you know, number of hours of sunlight in a day. They just assume all of that is identical. And then there are questions that come up that are, will play with whether or not that's actually the case. Mm. Yeah, I've seen them do it with mercury levels in fish. I mean, we could do this all day. There's lots and lots and lots of examples of this. The good news is this makes it really predictable. See causality in an assumption question, you should know exactly what to expect of answer choices. See the author using some historical data or facts to try to make a prediction or draw a conclusion now, you know exactly what to expect. The more predictable this test becomes, the easier it gets. Take the next one as well, because I think you are, uh, you've written oh, before on this topic. I, this is actually how I teach it as a first step. So question 11, what's the difference between must be true and a necessary assumption question. And there are some differences. So let me touch on those first. The biggest difference, I think, is that necessary assumptions contain arguments. Must be true, typically don't. You'll see a conclusion in assumption questions. Must be true as often as we started this with, a fact set, a set of premises. So that is the difference. But the real answer that I was getting at with this question is there's not much else that's different. Fact of the matter is, the answer choice in a necessary assumption is something that must be true. You're just basing it instead of off a fact set, off an argument. It will follow from and be proven by the conclusion. It's to say to some students, and, and maybe this goes too far, Dave, and you can walk me back. It's the only time on the test where you can reliably trust what the author says, where you can just believe it at face value and use that argument, however good or bad, to evaluate answers and see if they come from it. It's the one time I allow a degree of, like, credulity. <laughs> it's 
So that's the way that I tend to look at those two things. But you can actually approach necessary assumptions like must be true questions and eliminate answers from must be true failures. New information, too extreme, shell game. So you see this a lot. And I, I think it's one of the most powerful and probably underutilized ideas on one of the toughest questions. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree with you. And I've always found the kind of similarity between the two fascinating in terms of how they actually work out because – they seem so dissimilar on the surface, must be true, and a necessary assumption idea. One of the ways I've used in class to kind of describe this is it's the same type of operation, but before and after. So an assumption is like this before idea. It's something that the author took as true on the way to kind of like formulating the entire argument and arriving at that conclusion. Whereas must be true is often something that follows from that argument. It's almost like after the argument has been formed or after all the pieces of information have been assembled. That before and after looks really big, but ultimately they're all on the same spectrum of, hey, you got to have it. One's just being used on the way to the argument slash conclusion and the other's kind of following from it thereafter. But the similarity that you know exists between the two is undeniable. I like that. I'm stealing it. I don't know why I would let you. I don't know how you would stop me. <laughs> You're exactly right. <laughs> I have no power here. But that's kind of like, this is the nuance. You know, I think about the fact that uh, sometimes on the podcast, we're having fun, we're joking around, and we're talking about admissions or statistics. What we're talking about right now, this is what we do. This is what we teach in our classes. This is what the kind of things I put in our books, in our courses. This is the th stuff where when you start to understand this, your landscape of knowledge about the LSAT grows at such a fast rate and becomes so vast that you start to see how questions relate to each other. And you can see what they're doing and how you can kind of like draw a connection between various things. And when you start doing that as an LSAT student is when you start getting really good. When you're like, this question reminds me of this question, even though they're not the same question type. You can see what happens. You see the choices that the test makers have when they've constructed a certain stimulus. That makes you ultra powerful. And guess what? It usually makes people ultra confident as well sure, as they man. go through this. This is how you see the matrix. Indeed. <laughs> I'm Neo. Yes, you are. I'm Morpheus. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you want to take 12? I do. All right. So what is the difference between essentially a sufficient assumption and a necessary assumption, or as we often call them, a justify the conclusion kind of setup and a regular assumption setup? Well, the first answer is often there's not. Often they're identical. So when you look at it, that's confusing in and of itself. And the reason they're often identical is because they overlap quite a bit. Now, we've already talked about a necessary assumption is an unstated premise. It's something that an author absolutely has to kind of make the pieces fit together. It's a really minimalist type of idea. What is the bare minimum the author was thinking to have all the rest of this make sense? And so when you look at answers that are necessary assumption answers, they're rather spare. There can't be any extraneous information. From the standpoint of how we think about the construction of argumentation, these assumptions are necessary conditions for the validity of the conclusion, kind of however you want to call it, validity, truth, what have you. So when I look at that necessary assumption, the word necessary is there because it's a necessary condition. On the other side, the sufficient assumption, what we call the justify the conclusion answer, is not nearly as spare. It's the piece that will allow you to make the argument make sense. But it doesn't have to be just that piece. You can add other things to it. So it's sufficient. When you add it to all the information that you already have, it then forces the conclusion to follow and be true. So if you were to look at this, it's kind of like sufficient assumption, then you're going to the truth of the conclusion and the validity of it, then you actually go over, you continue on with an arrow to the necessary assumption. And I used to put this on the board in the early days of teaching this type of idea. The difference though, from an operational standpoint is, necessary assumptions can't have anything additional, mm -hmm. sufficient assumptions can. So if the answer that you need here is three oranges, and that would be sufficient to make the argument make sense, it's just fine to see an answer that says three oranges and an apple. The apple's not gonna cause a problem there. 
Whereas in a necessary assumption answer, you could never have that additional piece of information. That would make the answer wrong immediately because the author wouldn't have assumed anything about an apple. Yeah, and they do test this. It's one of the big reasons that you have to be able to distinguish these two question types. Necessary assumptions will fail because answers contain an extra piece, some extraneous thing you did not require. Justify answer choices will succeed even with that excess. If you can't tell them apart, it's really hard to know whether it's allowed or not. I love yeah. that idea. And it's fantastic. And, and so you really have very different ways of solving these questions in, in terms of like looking at this, especially with justify, you're able to go in there and say, hey, let's actually add all this together. Does it give me the result I want? Whereas on the necessary side, we're actually denying the statement to see whether or not it destroys the argument. Two totally different approaches that are based upon what is allowed on each side of it. That's yeah. definitely one of the tougher questions. Convoluted, of course, by the fact that they can also be identical. All right. Let's move on to number 13. 13. <laughs> All right. I like this one. You read it, but I'm going to do it. What kind of question type is this question stem reflecting? Here it is. Which of the following, if assumed, does the most to justify the conclusion? There's a couple of false flags here. There are a couple of words intentionally, and we didn't choose this. This is a real question type. The test makers have chosen this to use these words to distract or mislead you. It has the word assumed in it, which the following if assumed. It has the word justify in it. Does the most to justify the conclusion? If you guessed either of those question types, I have bad news for you. It's a strengthen question. If assumed just means the answers are true. Of course, that's the case for strengthen. Does the most to justify the conclusion just means is the most helpful, gets you the closest to proof, but doesn't have to go all the way. Justify answer choices have to go all the way. That they've qualified it with most lessens the degree to which it must prove the argument. It takes it down into the realm of strengthen. Tricky, tricky. There you go. So you see that most. Yep. The power, the force, the certainty is lessened, and that takes it off justify down to strengthen, as you said. Mm -hmm. Let's go to number 14, some formal logic terminology. <laughs> this, everybody better have gotten right, unless you're new to the LSAT, in which case you get a free pass. So what's the definition of some? At least one, possibly all, which again, a lot of times people miss the possibly all. So if you use a zero to 100 scaling, sum is one to 100. It's everything but zero. Mm -hmm. What about most? Well, that's a majority, possibly all. So on that number scaling, we typically call it 51 to 100. And you can think of all the different words that would uh, kind of like go along that same idea, likely, tend to, that type of thing. Those are the same idea as most. Happens more often than not. That's what most means. More than could half. it happen all the time? You bet it could. And then one of my favorites, the construction either or. This is one where you see this all the time where people will say like, well, that means one or the other. It does not. It means at least one of the two, possibly both. Mm -hmm. So irrespective of any other information, if I say either A or B occurs, you could have A occur and not B, you could have B occur and not A, or you could have both A and B, which means that either or, again, without any other information, is functionally identical to some. It means at least one, possibly all, or both happen. Yeah. It's kind of so cool. It's very cool, I think. The, I think the thing that defies expectations here is that some can mean all, most can mean all, and either or can mean you don't actually have to choose. You can pick them both. Yeah, and it's funny because one of the side questions I was going to ask in here was, what's the difference between could be true and not necessarily true? Mm. We forgot to include that because that's one that I often would throw at people. But uh, that's one of those ones that if you listen to this episode and you want to like, you know, give a shot at it, post it on Twitter to me. Tell oh, okay. me, you know, what's the actual difference between the two? Where are they similar? Where are they dissimilar? Because that's a mind pondering thing. If you haven't really worried about the idea of truth, how does could be true and not necessarily true relate to each other? All right, let's go to number 15, John. Some flaws. Yeah, I'll take this one. Okay. What flaw does presuppose what it sets out to prove represent? Well, if you're presupposing what you're intending to prove, it means you took for granted what your conclusion was. That is a circular argument right there. And if anybody wants to try another Twitter exercise, 
Tell me why they call it a circular argument. What's the reasoning behind that? See if anybody, uh, you know, wants to take a shot at that. I'm digging your own grave here, my friend. Am I? Or well, someone's we'll got see. to put themselves on the public line. So we'll see who's uh -huh. got the, uh, the stones to do that. All right. All right. How about this next one, John? What flaw does presume without justification that a circumstance that is sufficient to guarantee a particular outcome is in fact required for that outcome represent? What would you say? That's a mouthful. Um, well, first of all, I'd say there's some clues in here. So even if you were taking something of a blind swing at it, you should have been able to pick this one out just from words like sufficient or required, guarantee, these sorts of things. But what they're actually representing here with this is one of two things, either a mistake in negation or a mistake in reversal. In either case, the outcome or what they're describing is someone who has confused the role of a sufficient condition and the role of a necessary condition in a relationship. Yeah. Usually this would be related to like the reversal where they, th mm -hmm. they, were, they confused this uh, the sufficient condition and then said to themselves, well, it's necessary. So if you're diagramming, it would probably look like a mistaken reversal. But again, as we talked about before, it doesn't really matter. Right. It's the same exact error, and that's just mixing up the conditions there. Perfect. Know your flaw answer choices. Know your categories, guys. This is the second difficult element in flaw, really. It's not just spotting what's wrong in the stimulus. It's deciphering, decoding these linguistic thickets that you get down in A through E. You have to know what these represent. Nice. Uh, Why don't continue on with the next one? All right. Speaking of flaw, 16. What's the meaning and the difference between the common flaw answers that begin with, quote, takes for granted, the author takes for granted, and the author overlooks the possibility? I think the meaning and the difference are answered by the same explanation. So let me just tackle two at one here. Takes for granted, the author takes for granted, the author presumes, the author, um, again, anything takes without warrant, anything like that is talking about something that appeared within the argument. It's a presence within the stimulus that the author did not give sufficient reason to present or to believe. You don't have reason to believe it, even though the author does and presented it as though it were true. That's what takes for granted means. It's present. It's there. So the first test of that answer choice is you have to go find it. It's a treasure hunt, a scavenger hunt. If it's not up there, that answer is wrong straight away. If it is there, you have to then consider whether or not the author went too far or was, again, on shaky ground to have included it. And that is a very specific circumstance. The author overlooks the possibility. The author fails to consider. That is a very different circumstance. This is about absence. This describes something that has to be missing from the argument, but that would be problematic or that the author would have been better served to have considered. To me, these almost turn into weakened answer choices. Overlooks the possibility, what would happen if I introduced it? So the test of these answer choices is first, you go look for it. It cannot be there. If it is, it's gone. It's the wrong answer. Has to be absent. And then secondly, as you introduce it, consider the look on the author's face as he heard it. Like, oh man, I should have thought of that. If the author doesn't recoil, if the argument isn't harmed in some way by you introducing this, again, it's not relevant and it's wrong, but those are almost opposite answer choices from one another. You have to understand them. The hardest flaw questions these days really trade in those answer choices. Very nice. Let's move on to number 17. All right. What doesn't need to be matched or paralleled in parallel reasoning questions? I feel like we should have given a hint here. We're looking no. for two things. That wouldn't have been too much, would it? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no help. There's no, yeah. There's no given Dave today. Teacher, I have a Hard question. Line. No. John's walking over like, what do you need? And I'm like, no questions. Yeah. <laughs> Hands down. Well, there's a lot of things that do need to be matched, you know, the nature of the conclusion or the intent of it, whether there's a flaw in the argument that has to be matched, the nature of the premises has to be matched. But I'll tell you two things that immediately come to mind that do not is the order of the pieces of the argument. So the, whether the conclusion is first or whether the premises are first or whether it's premise, conclusion, premise, you don't have to match that. Nobody cares about that. In fact, that's one of the things that they often use to trip people up is they kind of like reconfigure the order and the answers. The other thing is the topic. You don't have to match the topic. So if you've got a question about banking, 
you don't have to have an answer choice about banking. And usually an answer choice about banking would be wrong unless all five of them were about banking. So topic doesn't matter and order of the argument parts or pieces does not matter. Let's go to number 18, unless you have anything to add. No, no, no. That was beautiful. Definitive crushing. Number 18, what logical reasoning question family does evaluate the argument fit into? This is a, a trick dirty. question. Yeah, a little dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Getting vicious, man, as we get down here into some of the later questions. So what family is it? Well, what are you being asked to do? You're you Typically, you're given... Uh, an argument, and then there's a claim, and they're like, well, which of the following would be most useful to know in evaluating the argument? Meaning, what question are you supposed to come in and ask of the author that would prove that the argument is strong or weak? And that's the key right there. This is a very unique question, really the only one of its type that spans both the second and third families. It spans two different families. It is both a strengthened question and a weakened question. And because of the way we solve these, we have a technique that actually allows you to look at them and kind of run through an approach that gives you a look at both sides of strengthening and weakening. And so the answer is it doesn't fit into one, it fits into family two, which is help, and family three, which is to weaken or undermine. Yeah, I just realized my hint from 17 would have been good for 18 as well. What doesn't need to be matched? We're looking for two things. What family <laughs> does evaluate the argument? We're looking for two. You're just That's asking to help. I know. I know. One of these days. I'm bringing the hard line, and here you are trying to like give away the answers behind my back. Yeah, but you're all steel toe boots tonight. I don't mind it. <laughs> it's mind not it. often that the, the, that's the way that it is, but I don't do it. That is the way that this needs to be, though, and I think people should hold themselves to the same, same standards that we're trying to assert here ourselves. Again, if, if more than a couple of these really stumped you or were just baffling, that's a genuine problem and you need to fix it. Yeah. Now, if you're early on in the process and you've been studying for like four weeks, six weeks or something like that, or you've been studying for like a month or two and you haven't had a lot of time to study, then don't worry about it. Just think to yourself, wow, there is an actual level of specific knowledge that I can reach and that mm -hmm. is achievable and that I can use as a platform to really start like breaking these questions apart. At the advanced level, we can really tear these questions apart in a very mechanical way. And then what's left over is a lot of mental energy and a lot of extra test time to deal with the more nuanced, abstract stuff that they've been doing recently. You crush what you can crush based upon all the techniques and approaches and kind of like black and white knowledge that you have about this test. And then that gives you more time and confidence to deal with the stuff that's a little bit less certain, or as I like to say these days, a little more squishy. Squishy. And on that note, I'll dive into 19. Do it. So list the various question types that have a definitive or concrete method to prove the correct answer. So there should have been several that jumped out to you automatically as types that you could apply a test to to see whether or not, in a very litmus test, in a very defined way, whether or not you had the correct answer. The first one that always comes to me is the necessary assumption. Mm -hmm. because you can apply the assumption negation technique to that and automatically look at it and say, all right, if this is the correct answer, if I negate this answer, it's going to have to attack the argument. If it doesn't attack the argument, it's wrong. So that's the first one. There's also the one on the other side of that fence with justify the conclusion where you can apply the justify formula and say, look, if I go ahead and take what I think is the correct answer and I add it to the premises that I was given in the argument, the combination of those two should combine and force the conclusion that we saw in the stimulus. Yeah, we literally call it the justified formula. <laughs> it's formulaic, as mechanistic as it gets. Yeah, it's a mathematical equation for logic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that a lot of people don't like math, but when you start adding it to logic, sometimes it's really helpful to be able to see it because none of the math is calculus. It's simple addition. This is answer choice plus premises equal conclusion. That's simple and powerful. Assumption negation is deny this answer choice, remove, uh, you know, add a negative to it, take it out if you need to, and then see what kind of effect that has. Should turn it from a, you know, that kind of like helping answer into a weakened one. 
Here's one we just talked about. Evaluate the argument. The variance test allows you to take the answer choice and supply opposing answers to it. If it's a yes, no, use yes and no. When you have the right answer, uh, one response will weaken it and the other response will strengthen it. If you have a wrong answer, you give opposing answers, it has no effect whatsoever. They don't use evaluate very often, but every time I see it, I love it. I'm like, bring that to me. I'm going to destroy you. I will be out of here in 30, 40 seconds and on to the next question because I know how to solve those questions. And there is a technique that is literally foolproof when applied correctly. Then the last two are going to be point at issue and point of agreement. So if you have a point at issue, what do you have? You have a scenario where two people are disagreeing. When you have the right answer, one person has to definitively say, you know, I agree with that. And the other person has to say, no, I disagree with that. So you have the agree-disagree test. On the point of agreement questions, now you're looking for something where they both agree with it or both disagree with it. But that's another litmus test that throws itself in there as well. So those five that we just talked about are five different types of questions, some of them fairly common, that you have absolutely ironclad techniques. And there's other question types out there that have, again, we'll use that word squishy, a little bit less definitive types of, of approaches. It must be true in method of reasoning, you have the fact test, which kind of underlies, if you're going to select an answer and must be true, you have to say that it came from somewhere directly in the stimulus. That's true on an abstract level with method of reasoning as well. Flaw, too, while we're talking about it. Mm. And then you have the elemental attack that we use for parallel reasoning, where we break it down and say, find the conclusion, you know, kind of duplicate that, do the same thing with the premises, look for flaws, and so forth. And so that is a little bit less specific and concrete, but it's still super helpful. That's it's a contextual. Right? Yeah, it's contextual. But that's a ton of different questions where there's like really simple, solid approaches that will help you solve the problems. Yeah. And that's, I mean, God, that's about the best news you could get. Sorry we waited till 19 to give it to you, but it is great news. The way I tend to think about must and parallel is you can often gauge it by the question stem, the wording of the question stem. So for instance, a must question that says, which of the fine can be properly inferred? You're going to be able to prove that answer. There's no squishiness to the right answer there. And in parallel, which of the following contains the same pattern of reasoning? There's no give. That's not the most justified type of qualification we looked at before. That's an all or nothing deal. So in those circumstances, and this is what I meant by contextual, you can know that the right answer is, in fact, black and white, mathematically provable. All right. I like it. That brings us to number 20 and the final item of the night. That question was, can you ever prove that a sufficient condition occurs as part of a conclusion. So you've got a premise that's A arrow B, and they don't later on in a premise tell you that A happened. Can you have a conclusion that tells you that A occurred? You asking me? Yeah, why not? All right. Well, if you consider all the discussions we've had tonight about the dangers of mistaken negations and mistaken reversals and the flaws that exist in trying to think um, that you can go backwards against an arrow, say, and sufficient conditions are never provable. You can prove the absence of one if the necessary is gone. You can start with the sufficient condition if it's given to you, but you can never arrive there. And that's what a conclusion is, a destination, an arrival point. Sufficient conditions are a launching point. They're your start, not your finish. Yeah, and I think somebody might say, who cares? Mm -hmm. The fact that I can't do that, what's the big deal? I'll be like, well, you're going to miss some principal questions in the future, just so you know. So as long as you're okay with that, then we're good. Because they love to do this. They'll give you a principal question and, and maybe throw some parallelism around it. Uh, but they don't have to. They can do it in different ways. But then they'll give you this relationship, and you'll have A, arrow, B. And then I will immediately think to myself, if they're going to try to prove A occurred at some point, I know that's wrong. Unless there's a flaw idea in there, it's going to be just wrong. And so there's numerous problems. In fact, in our course, again, in the LRB, I went to lengths to say, here's this concept. They are doing this to you, and you don't have to be defenseless against it. I'm able to attack those problems. I see that coming well before it even shows up. And so when it does show up, whether it's answer choice A or C or E, I welcome it because I'm like, I knew you were going to appear at some point, and I know that you have to be wrong immediately. 
again, saving mental energy, saving time, building confidence. So that kind of question, which is really abstract, if you thought to yourself, well, I'm not really sure, you need to go back and think about how all that stuff works because there is no way to actually prove it aside from another piece of information that says it happened. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about. We're like, add something new, some other condition to it, can't do it. It's not yeah. going to work out that way. And they play that game all the time. And there's other variations of that as well. That's, I was just thinking about two variations I see constantly, which are in justify and assumption questions, where an answer choice will give you the right pieces, the pieces you know you must connect from premise to conclusion, but send you in the wrong direction, send you from the conclusion back to a premise. It's really the same idea. The conclusion has to be something you arrive at, you get to. You cannot move away from it. You cannot arrive at a sufficient condition. 100% agree. And that's your 20 questions right there. <laughs> So rate yourself and how you did. And of course, there's sub-questions in there. You sure. saw how we added uh, multiple parts to more than a few of them. So it's uh, easily over 25, maybe it's 30. 30 by the yeah. time it's all said and done uh, that's in there. But keep in mind what the point of this was. The point is to say, where are you? How are you doing? And this is especially useful if you're in the middle of your studies or you feel like you know, you're reaching a plateau or you feel like, I've done everything, I've done all the questions. This is a good way to test yourself and say, well, really, have you? Do you know what you could know? Often the answer is, hey, I still have a little bit of way to go. That's great. Then you now know that and you can kind of like go and focus on these areas. It's not a negative if you miss some of these. It's actually a positive because it tells you there's more to learn. I love it. I, I will say for just a informational, pure distilled information in the amount of time we just spent. Good God, man. That was like, <laughs> I looked like my carry-on for a long trip. It was just <laughs> everything smashed in. I think we were thinking this could go really, really long. And it did, but at the same time, I, I think to me, lot, I am bro. positive I will refer back to this episode quite a bit as being That's high right. value. Because this is the type of, in a more limited fashion, exercise that I would engage students on when they would come to me and be like, I, I've already done this or I already know that. I'm like, well, let us see. And if you did listen to the comments I made in the middle about hitting me on Twitter over some of the, some of the kind of like comparisons, why is circular reasoning actually circular? Why do they use that term? And then what's the difference between could be true and not necessarily true? You can also approach that as how are they similar? Uh, I would love to see some answers on that. We'll see if any any anyone is uh, intrepid enough to throw that out there. But love this episode. Think it's a super cool idea. Uh, we'll get to the episode that we scrapped probably in about six months when we when it's more at the start of the LSAT cycle than it is now. John, any final comments? No, man. I, I'm with you though. This one's going to get starred or bookmarked by me too. I think. There's not a student I know of at any at some point in their preparation who wouldn't benefit from doing this run through, really putting their feet to the fire and seeing how they come out of it. 100% agree. And on that note, if you can, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it in the world. If you've enjoyed it, leave us a comment and a rating as well. And if you have questions for us, you can send those to lsatpodcast at powerscore.com. On behalf of John and myself, stay safe out there, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you.